Welcome to the Today's Leader Podcast. The podcast for the leaders and entrepreneurs of today. Way to go, guys. Way to go. Keep it going. Good job, guys. All right, Paul. I see Hey there, it's Coach Curl here, and welcome to episode 306 of the Today's Leader podcast. My guest on this episode has been described as a cross between Thor, Mick Jagger, and Lady Gaga. (laughs) Wow. I had so much fun with this episode, direct from the island of Bornholm in the Baltic Sea, Klaus Rausted is an innovation strategist. Klaus has been pushing the limits of the possible for 20 years. He's director of, at the College of Extraordinary Experiences, a coach at McKinsey and & Company, and has created 100 keynotes in 100 days on his YouTube channel. Phenomenal. The man's just a bundle of energy. He's a prolific author with 34 books to his name, including the innovation cycle. Now, what can I say about this podcast episode except wow, except wow. This is a rolling, righteous, rollicking conversation. It's an insight into the very nature of humans and how we live in this world of innovation. Klaus delivers global expertise into innovation in a fun way that simply works. If Expanding Minds was a KPI for a podcast, then this will be number one. So after we pay some bills, strap yourself in. I bring you Klaus Rousted. The podcast is brought to you by Think and Grow Business, the home of the Think and Grow Business Mastermind. If you're serious about growing your business, get serious and join a mastermind group today. Find out more at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. And And it's my pleasure to welcome Klaus Rousted to the Today's Leader podcast. How are you, Klaus? It's risky to ask a Scandinavian that because we'll always (laughs) give like a real answer. It'll be half an hour long and you'll end up being just as depressed as we are. So never (laughs) ask a Scandinavian, how are you? But apart from that, I'm pretty good. So your day's going well then. (laughs) I'll take it from that. Now, you are the very first person I have interviewed that lives on an island in the Baltics. There are not that many islands in the Baltic Sea, but there are some. And the one I live on, (laughs) Bonholm, is a part of Denmark, even though it's situated south of Sweden. And when the Swedes took it over 500 years ago or so, uh, the locals threw them out. And then the, the Swedish viceroy went to the Swedish king and said, the locals threw me out. I need an army to reconquer them. And the king said, that's not happening. So for about 100 years, uh, Bonholm was de facto Swedish, but in reality, it was Danish or independent. And then when the next war between Denmark and Sweden rolled along, Denmark got it back as part of the, the peace talks. So it's fiercely nationalistic, fiercely its own, and should be Swedish, but isn't. <laughs> I love places that have a story. In Australia, our concept of islands is something tropical with, you know, sand and and palm trees. I'm I'm finding it hard to visualise what an island in the Baltic Sea looks like, Klaus. It's a little bit uh, rocky and uh, and uh, a, f- a little bit Mediterranean, but more like okay. Nordic Mediterranean, not real Mediterranean. So, like the Viking sort of uh, scenario. I'm taking it's cold. I'm. It's, I mean, right now, summer has finally hit us, so it's pretty nice. Uh, It's branded as the Sunshine Island because it has 200 hours more sunshine per year than Denmark on average. And, of course, that's been used in tourist branding. Excellent, excellent. Now, now tell me the Klaus Rausted story because you're a fascinating human being. So I usually just tell people I'm a fascinating human being and then let them guess the rest. <laughs> and then, then they don't want to talk with me. So it's very effective. No, the, the reality is that I spent, I dropped out of university like so many others. And then I spent 15 years building what would become the world's biggest live action role play studio. So a company that focused on making dreams come alive, letting people wow. step into fiction, like being part of a movie with no script and no director but you got to be the characters and live the action, fully improvised. 
And I was one of the pioneers in that space, and we did some pretty wild stuff. And then in, in about two years ago, it all came crashing down. Too many long-term gambles, too many big dreams, too little business sense. And yeah. an explosive growth from five people to 47 in a couple of years. And it all crashed. And I ended up with a little over a million US dollars in personal debt as the CEO and, and owner of the company. Um, and needed to find out what am I doing now? And since then, I've been... Well, paying off a lot of debt has been one thing. Yeah. And and then since then, I've moved into innovation spaces, into marketing, into storytelling, but away from these fictional universes and very much into the real world, working with very big corporations, with big organizations. Um, so, yeah. so right now, apart from still doing the experience design work and kind of the the real crazy creative stuff. I work as a coach at McKinsey and Company, the consulting company, and I'm a founding member of the Global Institute for Thought Leadership. So big crash, lots of adventures, trying to find a new space in the world. And that's uh, both fun and terrifying. And don't <laughs> don't get a million dollars into personal debt. That let that be my first tip to your uh, your listeners. Just don't do that. It's not it's not as fun as it sounds. I can only just imagine I, what that would feel like. The weight of that. So, so the director at the College of Extraordinary Experiences. So is that um, the dream that came crashing down, or is that still no, active today? That's one of the things we managed to lift from the dying dream. And the yeah. College of Extraordinary Experiences is somewhere between a business conference, a network event, a self-development vacation, and a yeah. experience design accelerator held at a 13th yeah. century castle in Poland. I've seen some of the videos. It looks like bedlam. If, if, <laughs> if, there, if, there, if there's like an image or something, it just looks manic. There's, it's really expressive. There's... I'm taking it there's a whole range of storytelling techniques that are going in there and it's it's almost like that um you know we hear the term gamification and in learning especially yours seems to be real play gamification am yes. I have I yes. have I got the concept right very very much so so gamification very roughly speaking is the idea of taking game concepts things like points and competition and story and development uh, and narrative and mechanics and putting them into something else, business or yeah. tourism. And my partner at the College of Extraordinary Experiences, Paul Bulencia, some years back wrote the defining book on gamification in tourism, on how you take a tourist experience and add gamification uh, elements to it to help it, to make it stronger. So we take some of that, we take some from the live action role play pass that I have, we take yeah. some from the world of business, and then we mix in amazing people from all over the world, and we get what is a, a pretty wild and crazy, but also for some people, life-altering event. I can imagine. What sort of outcomes do you, so a business... Is it uh, traditional business people going to these events, Klaus, or is it individuals? So one, one, the way to answer that question is to say a little bit about what the college is. For many, many years, people have pursued innovation, which is yeah. a fancy word for change and for new ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And innovation happens, it happens in two places. Well, it happens all over, but there are two places where it really happens. One mm -hmm. is if you put people together who are roughly the same in a comfortable environment, 50 doctors, 50 filmmakers, 50 bricklayers, 50 policemen. If you create a nice space where they feel comfortable with sharing and with listening, then you will have incremental innovation. You'll have small things where somebody says, oh, we do it like that, or did you try it like this, or how about that? Yeah. That works. Professional conferences all over the world are built on this concept. It, it works. Yeah. It's nice. But if you want radical innovation, if you want like yeah. the 10x stuff, then you need to find people who are different. Then you need to put the CEOs with the homeless guys, the street artists with the doctors, the filmmakers with the Formula One drivers. And the wow. college is that. It's this tightly curated event, again, at a medieval castle, which means everyone's a little bit out of their depth. And, and it's, it's gathering people from all sorts of cultures, all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of industries who would yeah. never have met. And then creating an atmosphere where when they talk, 
they trust each other they're open because normally when you curate if you sit down a fortune 500 ceo next to a street artist and uh an athletic dancer then what's going to happen is they're going to look at each other and they're going to say you're too wrong you're too corporate too artsy mm -hmm. too young too old too french do something where if, if you can create an experience for them first that tie them together then you get the chance of actual open honest conversation and that's the college in a nutshell I can hear my listeners and their discomfort with that sort of a process already in some respects and <laughs> and I'm talking to leaders that want to change and want to develop but um, you know sometimes when you when we're going to take them outside of their comfort zone that's like jumping and leaping through multiple layers of, of discomfort to get into that sort of a aspect. I'd imagine the results are amazing. So there's a simple psychological model, and I learned of it from actually a college alumni, Jesper Toft, a friend of yeah. mine who's a psychologist who, who does leadership training. And he says that simply put, when you talk about growth, human growth, yeah. there is situation, pain, growth, new situation. And it doesn't really work any other way. So if you want to grow, you need to get into the uncomfortable space. And as kids, yeah. we know that. I have a three-year-old daughter. I see her doing it every day. We are so good as kids at becoming, yeah. at being uncomfortable, at trying stuff that doesn't work, at experimenting. And then the better we get, the more we feel is on the line. And the, in general, and, and I, I coach leaders as well, and I find that the better they are at something, the worse they are at being bad. Yeah, because we so don't this, look bad this either. Learning, learning how to be uncomfortable, learning how to step outside your comfort zone, learning yeah. how to learn, that's a really, really tricky skill. Because when you're if you're bad at everything, then every then then there's no problem because everything you do will make you better. But if you're the world's best violinist or the world's best shoemaker or the world's best kind of peak performance team coach, then when somebody yeah. says, Yeah, the world's changing, you need to do something different, then you go back to square one, then you suck. And that's bad. That, that's terrible. The, yeah. the, the, one of the prices of success is that it's terrifying to go back. Where if you're just generally bad or generally mediocre, then it's not that scary. But if you are like, if you're the number one football player in the world, if you're Cristiano Ronaldo, and somebody yeah. says, Cristiano, how about taking up show dancing? Then even though he'd probably be better at it than most people due to yeah. general athleticism and, and kind of a lot of psychological stuff, it would be terrifying because he needs to go from so far up to so far down. And that's scary. Yeah. It's um, that whole concept that no one wants to look bad. And um, I, I certainly can understand that. I, my wife and I run marathons. I mean, funnily enough, people don't necessarily get that from the way that we look, but we always set challenges and we run marathons. And along the course class, there's always photographers and it's always interesting because no matter how you're feeling and and um, struggling through running 42K, um, whenever you come to a photographer, all of a sudden you've got your chest pus puffed out and you've got a smile on your face. And every now and again, you might do a, a jump just to try and get something different in your photos. And then once the photographer's passed, you go back into your, your, your state of exhaustion. So... It, it, it's it's all about um, the concept that we all want to look good and, you know, the concept that you talked about where people have to physically go back to um, to learn a new skill, to learn a new task. One of the people in my network says, Tony, you've got to be so prepared to fail that you're willing to fall flat on your face and lose everything and still get up. And, you know, that's um, that's a mindset of the very select few, I'd imagine. So let's... Um, you mentioned innovation, and this is where you um, really fascinate me because you've been working in this space um, way longer than many people have been talking about innovation. And I, I like that simple concept that innovation is fundamentally change and you've got the incremental and you've got the radical. Um, but a lot of people struggle with innovation and a lot of businesses struggle with innovation. I'd really like to get your thoughts as to why you believe that's the case. So... I've, for many, many years, I've been working with kind of pushing boundaries and uh, expanding the envelope and whatever all these weird expressions are that we mix up when we want to sound smart. But yeah. for the last half year or so, after writing this, the Innovation Cycle book, my number 30, <laughs> um, 
after writing that, I thought I'd, I'd focus exclusively on the innovation space. So I changed my title to become an innovation strategist. And I kind of re-edited my past. So everything I'd ever done since I was born was about innovation, as we do yeah. when we try to kind of recast yeah. ourselves. And one thing I found, which was pretty damn interesting, is that innovation is something everybody wants. There's a lovely McKinsey study from some years back that says 84% of CEOs think innovation is really important, but only 6% are satisfied with how their own company is performing. So wow. there's like a huge innovation gap. However, yeah. when you go out, and I found at least, I found that when you go out and talk to people about innovation, nobody wants innovation. Everybody wants problem solved. Nobody's sitting in a boardroom sitting, you know, Chris, I think we should get some innovation. They're saying, you know, Chris, our marketing department is sucking up resources or our communication processes are too slow or we're yeah. too bad at developing new products. They never say we want innovation because it's vague. And when it gets tricky, innovation is tied to identity. So, so a couple of things I've found on this space that might be interesting to more people than just us is one of them is when I went out and said, I'm now going to do more innovation work. I had a ton of people saying, oh, that's great. And you're so creative and you're such an out of the box thinker and everybody should have you on speed dial, blah, 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 all sorts of nice validation. And it felt really yep. good. Turned out nobody actually said, I want this. Nobody said, I want to become smarter. I want to learn more. Mm -hmm. I want, I want you to help me. They all thought I should help somebody else. And yeah. even the ones who hired me for this stuff, even the ones, whether it was for free because I did somebody a favor or, or a, a well-paid gig, it was always on behalf of somebody else, a team, a network, mm -hmm. a group, a class. Okay. Nobody said, I myself want innovation or if they did, it was very, very few. So one thing I tried a few weeks ago was saying, okay, what about productivity? It's the same stuff. It's changing things to do things differently. But what if I wrap it into the language of productivity instead of innovation? And I went out on LinkedIn and I said, okay, hello, LinkedIn network. I'm going to, I'm thinking about moving more kind of from the innovation in general to playful productivity and innovation. And then people started saying, oh, this is great. I want this. And when I ran my first mm -hmm. test webinar, I had 45 people sign up. One third of them were people who were not first-hand contacts, who were just people who'd seen it randomly on LinkedIn and said, this looks interesting because okay. productivity is a thing that I want, not that yeah. somebody wants, where innovation is a thing that kind of we want in a vague overall sense. And I found that to be pretty damn interesting that we all talk about innovation but we don't want it for ourselves. We want it for somebody else. And, and one of the reasons for it is that it's about identity. It yeah. also turns out that when you're selling innovation, the easiest place to sell innovation in a company is in the marketing department. And the reason for that is that if I go to you, if I go to, to, to your company, let's say you have a hundred people and you're selling shoes. And I say, Tony, your shoe company is doing great, not as well as Zappos with the other famous Tony, but still pretty well. I think you're in need of some innovation. You're going to say, yeah, not so much. But if I say, Tony, your company is doing great, but I think your marketing could be better. Let's innovate there. You're going to say, tell me more. Because then I'm saying, I'm saying indirectly, everything you do is great. You are great. Your people are great. You don't need to change. You just need better marketing. Where if I go in and say, you need to change you, we don't like that. That's identity. That's culture. That's like, ooh, that's painful. Where if somebody mm -hmm. says you need better marketing, that's divorced from me. That's pretty easy. That's, that's not painful. So selling innovation and marketing, a lot easier than selling innovation in culture or innovation in leadership. Because it's not about you. It's just about yeah. better salespeople, it's, better marketing, very... better awareness. It's um, that's so interesting because in self development and you know the the world's proliferation of uh, life coaches or in, coaches of any type, and most of them are selling the change aspect, the the personal change, the personal growth, the the personal development, and fundamentally the you know I I think a lot of people say three percent at any one three percent of people at any one time are looking for that. That's growth, that analysis, and usually that's 
um, you mentioned that pain and change cycle. You know, you feel some pain, you you make some changes, you you grow a little until you feel some more pain. So, so it, that's a fascinating concept. So I, I wonder if that can be then transcribed into the world of self development and how. So it's it. I, I guess it's a lot harder mm-hmm. to go up to someone and say, "Hey, you don't need to change," but your marketing can change or your branding can change. I don't know. I'm just sort of thinking outside the square there because it is absolutely true. People hate change and they really they, do. Ch- they like the results. The, the standard yes. joke is I want it different as long as it stays the same. And that, and, and that means, but, but just to kind of, to, to, uh, to hammer down and close down the marketing point, if I yeah. go to you, you have, you do a lot of stuff, but you, for example, have this podcast. If yeah. I go and say, Johnny, I have a way that you can double your amount of listeners, then you're going to be interested. You might yeah. not say it's worth it. You might not believe it, but you're going to be interested. And if I say, Tony, let me double your amount of listeners. I need to change your marketing. Then we're going to have a conversation where if I say, Tony, I know how to double your amount of listeners. Let's talk about your format. Mm. Yeah. You don't want that. Yeah. Formats, personal, you know, all yeah. of that stuff. That That's about me. That's about what I put out. And Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, we don't want, we don't want to be changed. We want change to happen outside of us. Yeah. Very interesting. So you're making a shift from innovation to productivity as part of your branding or as part of your marketing. What other um, shifts, are, I guess, are occurring in that innovation space? What What are you seeing at the moment outside of what you've developed for yourself? So a couple of things. One is Corona has been a blessing for innovation. Corona is terrible. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's impacted every every single person on the planet in some way, some of them in kind of the ultimate sense, so to speak. It's terrible. We wouldn't wish it on anyone. But when it comes to innovation on a global sense, it has been like a wonder drug because any sort of crisis means, especially a big one like this, means that things that before were not even considered, you now have to test them. So processes that took months before now take weeks or days, yeah. things yeah. that couldn't be done before. Now we need to find out, and some of them we find out, okay, they couldn't be really done, but some of them could. So on that note, innovation has become much more popular or, or kind of uh, understood because we've seen it in so many spaces. However, it also means for a lot of people, it's tied to the crisis. Yep. If I go to you and say, again, you're a hundred person shoe company, let's have 50% work remote forever. Then you're going to say, well, maybe the crisis allowed us to do that, but afterwards it's back to normal. Mm-hmm. Where reality is it wasn't about the, the crisis gave us the opportunity or, or yeah. forced us to take the chance, but it didn't actually produce the results. And that sort of thing is tricky. So, so that's one thing. The second is... Yeah. Innovation in general, and and I myself have really failed badly at this, but in general is because of globalization and because everybody's now digital, or not everybody, but a lot of us are now digital, it means everybody's potentially in a global marketplace. Hmm. So where we're so used to thinking locally, now we should think globally, no matter what what business we're in. That if you're thinking, okay, I have a school, I'd like somebody to give the commencement address to the students. Before, you would think of who's in your neighborhood, who might be a famous scientist who lives nearby, or who might be somebody we can afford, who can drive in from two hours away. But that's kind of the scope. Nobody's going to call Brad Pitt. But now, Brad Pitt could roll out of his bed, get on some pajamas, put the webcam high enough you don't see the pajamas, do a commencement address for a school in Sydney in the morning, one for a school in Hong Kong an hour later, and then when he's having breakfast, then he's going to talk to a school in California. Yeah. And that simply was not our world before it was possible, but it wasn't kind of accepted or the default. And that for what that means for businesses and, and organizations is for many of us, suddenly you can have people who are anywhere. And that means that I could be running a uh, dog, digital dog saloon service 
in Johannesburg, South Africa, right now. From the from the islands in in the from Balkans. the island, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and ironically, I do a lot of work in the Middle East, and that used to be getting on a plane, traveling ten hours, getting off in the airport in Riyadh or in Dubai or wherever, and then going to client meetings. I still do that work. I still support those people, but now because there's just two hours of time zone difference, it's so much easier. And of course, sometimes yeah. there's going to be that travel again when it's needed. But for the small stuff, it may, it suddenly makes total sense for me to do the majority of my work in the Middle East, even though I live in Denmark. And that was just rare beforehand. Yeah. It's been a, we, we had a guest on recently, Stephen Van Belligum from Belgium, and he talked about a very similar concept that COVID's just been this accelerator of, you know, the the technology and the AI world and, and our mindset and our experiences in doing, um, working with people internationally. I mean, one of the very small aspects I have in my life is to be communicating with leaders right around the world via this podcast. And part of that process has been then speaking with um, my local chamber of commerce and and now we're actually saying, well, as a guest speaker, we don't need to have, you know, someone in the local community. Why can't we go out and ask a, a global customer experience expert, someone like yourself even, to be our guest speaker at our business breakfast event. So it is changing the world. It is changing the mindset. And it's um, it's uh, it's fascinating to, to live and breathe and see it happening. Very much so. And also, there's I sometimes stumble into the, the concept that innovation is something that is about being on a higher level, where really mm. it's not. It's just about being on a different one. And a yeah. simple example is... Japanese is a language spoken by more than 100 million people as their primary language. German yep. is a language spoken by more than 100 million people as their primary language. Yet the amount of people who speak both German and Japanese is very, very small. And if you manage to do that, if you speak fluently German, fluently Japanese, then there is a market for you just, just because of that. If you also know something, say you're an expert on the auto industry or on mm -hmm. museums, then suddenly you have a niche because it's so easy to connect people, it means that the combinations of skills, the combinations of, of uh, knowledge areas is suddenly more accessible than ever before. And that means it's more important. So as you, as you say, you can reach out and you can say, oh, here's this guy in Tajikistan who has some interesting viewpoints on what we do. Let's call him. And sure, yeah. maybe he's not interested. Maybe he doesn't have time. But at least now he's accessible where before he was just he wasn't even on the map. Mm, absolutely. Would never have been part of the consideration, which which is um, part of the real fascination that I have with the, with everything that's going on at the moment. So, so Klaus, um, Australians aren't known for their innovation and there's global rankings that come out. Uh, year in, year out, and Australia doesn't feature too heavily. I think our innovation inputs are not bad, but our outputs are pretty ordinary. So what countries do well with this concept of innovation, and what is um, what do you see in those countries that they're doing better than others? So this is, oh, this is a complex question, but there are a couple of things. The Nordic countries have a tendency to do well in anything that's measured. It's... Yeah. it's it, it feels superior to say so, but luckily statistics back it. Also, yeah. when it comes to innovation. And part of the reason the Nordics do so well with innovation is, one, the penalty for failure is pretty low. If you live in a Nordic country, you have free health care, you have free education, you have a, a decent, well-functioning social welfare system. So no matter how much you fail, it's not going to kill you, unlike, for yeah. example, the U.S. Yeah. Second is because of high wages it's very tempting to try to technology your way out of manpower. There's some yep. places where if you want something solved, you just hire 10 guys and they're going to do it. Where here, if you hire just one guy, <laughs> that guy's going to be terribly expensive. There's, there's this standard kind of look of shock on the, on the faces of especially Americans when they learn the difference be between what you make flipping burgers at McDonald's in the U S and in Denmark. And that's, that's yeah. a lot. <laughs> and yeah. what that also means is, of course, 
most people say, oh, how cool to then work at McDonald's in Denmark. Well, yes, that's true. It's, it's actually a nice, it scores high on workplace stuff. It's a nice place to work. However, it also means the people who are running their McDonald's, every morning they're thinking, how can we automate away those pesky employees? because they're so yeah. damn expensive and that yeah. leads to a lot of technological innovation leads to a lot of efficiency innovation culture innovation etc and then of course there's the third thing which i think australians you have in spades which is the the kind of the cultural equality the idea that an idea can come from anywhere yeah and i think where just to, to put a, a spin on it where australia and i really don't know a lot about australian business culture so i'm on thin ice here but where Australia differs from, for example, Denmark is Australia is legendary for being relaxed. There's this, <laughs> it's, it's like a national export of like, she'll be chill, right, mate. mate. Yeah, yeah, she'll be right. And the tricky thing with that is that if you get up in the morning and say, Brenda, I've come up with an idea for how to make a 0.3 second increase on our production cycle. There's a chance that somebody else will say, yeah, let's do it. But there's also a chance they'll say, chill. Just, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's fine. But don't don't get too worked up about it. And we have that yeah. in 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 Denmark and Norway. We have the Yenta law, which is like, don't think you're better than anybody else. And that also is a problem there that, that don't think if you're not supposed to think you're smarter than anybody else, then coming up with ideas is tricky. I, I Luckily, imagine. there are other factors that count in our favor, but that's yeah. one thing that is not always good because if you're not supposed to think you're better than anybody else or you're not supposed to get too excited because just chill and have a beer, man, then, <laughs> then of course, you running breathless into the office to say you found the new thing or the new idea yeah. is going to be met with people going, we're fine. Don't worry too much. Yeah. We're in a U.S. office. They're going to go, have you found a way to make money, Craig? Let's do it tomorrow. Oh, you're mm. not a VP. Let's never listen to you at all. <laughs> <laughs> so there are, many, there are many factors. And then, of course, one huge advantage, and you guys really don't have that, is physical proximity. Yeah. In, in If you're Danish, you will most, not certainly, but most usually have been to quite a few other countries. Because if you drive for more than six hours, you've left your own. So yeah. you're used to inputs from all sorts of places. You're used to hearing mm -hmm. about and meeting people who do things differently. And innovation at its core is meeting people who do things differently and actually daring to take them seriously. And if you live on the world's biggest island and everybody lives 100 kilometers from everywhere else, I know that's not the case, but, but some of yeah. it, you, it's easy to get a bit insular. It's yeah, easy it to is. get a bit, well... That might work there, but it'll never work here, which, yeah. by the way, is the single biggest killer I hear in innovation. Yeah. Not doubting that it works, but saying that might work here, there, but it won't work it here. Won't work here. And, and when you look at Australia being such a large island, we've got the tyranny of logistics and we've got that whole concept that we've, we've got a big planet, it's not a big planet, a big country to service. And in, and in many ways, innovation should be driving that. So we see a lot of innovation from our retailers, for example, in re respect of supply chain. But um, but there are other avenues that uh, where I suppose we, we export a lot of people into Silicon Valley, into um, in the US, because they just don't seem to have the support or the, um, the infrastructure around them here. So... Logistical, yes, we're onto it because it, we're, it's such a big country. But you know, creating a new app or looking at a new way to get that speed in our in a checkout service online is probably not part of our culture, which is really really interesting. But you've certainly given me some insights there about uh, some certain countries and whatnot. So thank you for that. So, so you are where you are now. So you you've started to move away from this pure play innovation you're looking at it and marketing it as a productivity aspect do you think that's going to be wildly i'm sorry broadly um part of where that the um the market shifts i guess with innovation that people will start looking at it or phrasing it in a different way i think part of it is and then i think there, there are kind of there are two ways of selling innovation two really yeah. good ways 
and I didn't either. <laughs> so now I'm at least trying one. And one way is selling innovation is in something very specific. Yeah. If I come out and say I'm an expert on innovation in queuing at live events, then some people, most people are going to ignore me then because what do I have to do with them? But yeah. some people will say, okay, I'm in live events. I know queuing is a problem. Let's talk to this guy. Yeah. The second way of doing it is disguising it as something else. And that's what I'm trying with the productivity. With the productivity. And that's simply because even though Corona has shaken us up, we still live in a numbers driven world. We yeah. are still slaves to the Excel people. And that is bad for innovation because innovation by its, by its very existence measures things differently. Yeah. Do imagine yeah. going out to somebody in, let's say 1910 in Hollywood or in kind of a West Coast US and say, guys, here's the thing. We're bringing in this whole new medium, this whole new way of production, which is film instead of theater, and it's gonna change the world. And then somebody says, oh yeah, how many extra theater show tickets is it gonna sell? When the guy says, well, none, because it's a whole new thing. Oh, so it's not gonna sell any new t theater tickets. Well, I'm out because that's bad. It, it, and that's that's what we're, we're up against and it's it's much easier to sell an idea that will improve a known thing by 20% yeah than to sell a new idea that will improve a new unknown thing by a million percent yeah yeah everyone's always looking for that ROI aren't they that return on investment and um in in some ways as you've just explained that's going to hold us back in in so many ways and when you look at you know the the global juggernaut that is Uber and and what it effectively has done to taxi industries and forced that innovation or, or crippled the industries. Um, I mean, from what I understand, it took, and I'm still not sure of the latest figures of where Uber is in a productivity space, or sorry, a profitability space. But um, that was a whole market shift and a, and a disruptive force that's just changed that whole industry. So, Very Chris, much so. Who, who's inspired you? A lot of people, but uh, just to name a few that if, if there's one person, if somebody out there is sitting, okay, this Klaus, I'm done listening to him, but maybe he's inspired by somebody. That yeah. the first person you should find is a British gentleman named Rory Sutherland, R-O-R-I Sutherland, who is from the Ogilvy Advertising Agency and is also a behavioral, kind of a behavioral economy yeah. aficionado because he looks at human behavior for problem solving. And there's so much of his stuff online. There's so many talks and interviews and all of it is solid gold. So if you wanna look one place, that is Rory Sutherland. There's of course more people who inspire me, yeah. but that's just to give like one, one thing because it's all about looking at humans instead of looking at numbers. Sometimes numbers yeah. and humans, but, but always yeah. humans. You mentioned your story of um, non-success at the beginning where you ended up with that debt of a million bucks. Tell me about your relationship with failure and how you work through that yourself. So sometimes I teach people how to fail <laughs> and, and how to deal with uh, disaster. I've done quite a bit of that here in the last yeah. period of time, obviously. And, and part of it is... There are a couple of ways, this is of course a whole subject in itself, but kind of roughly put, failure looks super scary from the outside. Yeah. And from the outside, it's very hard to see the difference between failure and near failure and risk. And just to give a good example of that is that if, you, if you're at a football game and you stand at one goal, then 100 meters away, 100 like six meters away or five meters away is the other goal line. If you lie down on the grass and kind of look at grass level and you see the ball and the ball is five meters from the opposing goal line, you can't tell if it's five meters from the goal line or at the goal line because you're down lying on the grass and yeah. it looks the same to you. It's like it's far away. It's a small ball and you can't tell the difference. But if you're yeah. in the opposing, if you're in the opposing kind of goal field, the difference between zero meters and five meters is huge. Yeah. And if you're at like 10 centimeters, if you're a goalkeeper, I, I used to be a goalkeeper for a reality TV football team. So, so I, I've done my share of this on the field. The difference between 10 centimeters and 50 centimeters is enormous. 
Mm. And that goes for the rest of our lives as well. That if you're standing next to the edge of the cliff, one extra meter of space is the world. But when you're looking at it from 100 meters away, you can't tell the difference. So yeah. that's number one is, is getting to look realistically at what it actually is almost requires that you've been there or you are there. Because if not, it's going to look damn scary yeah. at a distance. And the second part is that once you're there, you once your problems are big enough, other problems disappear. Yeah. Right now, I owe this insane amount of money. I've, I've managed to pay off little over $300,000 in two years, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. um, but it also means that I went from a lifelong dream of earning about $5,000 per month. If I could do that, if I could make 5,000 a month doing what I loved, I was I would have been happy never happened. But that was the dream. And suddenly with this new debt situation, I found that I needed to pay off 15,000 a month. Mm. Yeah. So suddenly small expenses were no longer that relevant because it was big numbers that matter. It means today we don't, my girlfriend and I have a small daughter, we don't really have to worry too much about whether we eat, we eat out, whether we dine out or whether we go to a museum or so on, because it's not going to make a difference. Mm. If I need to bring in 15,000 a month to pay debt, whether it's 15,000, 15, five or 14, five, that doesn't really, that, that's not a significant difference. But the difference between using $500 or not per month on takeout, that yeah. is really big. Mm. And it, it also means that it's tempting to, if you're in a huge crisis, it's tempting to try to solve it doing stuff that doesn't work. The classic yeah. story is the Titanic and somebody saying, oh, but uh, what if we turn down speed by 10%? Well, everybody laughs because no, everybody knows it wouldn't, it wouldn't make a difference. Sure, you'd crash into the iceberg a little less forcefully, but it would still have gone to hell. Yeah. So you don't bother about that 10%. You bother yeah. about seeing if you can not hit the iceberg or not. Yeah. And in most of our lives, we bother about not the 10%, but the 4%. So this like the, the tiny, the tiny stuff that used to be problems no longer is. It also means that I can lend friends money. Even though I'm insane debt, I can lend a friend a I can lend them a thousand bucks because yeah. it's not going to change my life significantly. But if it's somebody who's an out of work student, who's really struggling and yeah. can't pay rent, it's going to make mean the world to them. Where yeah. for me, I mean, I'm so deep in the shit that whether I'm into my nostrils or just above them, well, that's not, that's not, it's not going to save me. Right. So I might as well help somebody else out. So I'm going to take from all of that, that sometimes to, to deal with failure, sometimes you've got to get out out of that intimacy that's surrounding the failure that surrounds you and, and try and get that observer objective and look at it from a, from a bigger and a deeper scale. Very that's, much. So. That's great advice. Um, that's, that's really good. Most people talk it's a, about failure is you learn from it, you do this, and I'm sure that you do that as well. But that's really um, critical for people. I think that if they can get outside of themselves and, and, almost like the observer, have a look and look at it from a different aspect. I, I think that's awesome. Now, you've written 31 books. Did I get that right? 34. 30, 34, 34? At, the, at the count. Yeah, it, it keeps going up. I have this bad tendency to write books. <laughs> so, leaders are readers. So, tell me about the book that's had the biggest impact on you. If you've had time to read, of course, in between oh, yeah. writing. <laughs> so one of the books that's had a huge impact on me is the book known collectively as Seth Godin's body of work. The marketing okay. guru, Seth Godin, has yep. written a ton of stuff on how to stand out, how to be important, how to sell, how to think differently. And I've read a, quite a bit of his stuff. Lynchpin was one of the first I read. Purple Cow was another. So, but his work in general, because it's about reframing thinking yeah. instead of numbers instead of instead of the small stuff think big um, yeah. and dare to be different that that has had i wouldn't say that it changed my thinking but what it did was that it validated it yeah yeah and there, okay. sometimes there's few things that are nicer than being a weirdo and realizing that somebody else has been there before and maybe you're not that weird 
you're just yeah. in the wrong place. There's another weirdo out there, maybe. So, yeah. um, I, I know Seth Godin's, uh, uh, is it Tribes? I'm, I've got yeah. Tribes on audiobook, and, and I remember listening to that when it first came out and just um, once again spellbound because it was almost like he was, you know, 18 months ahead of the curve and mm-hmm. where people were talking about communities and, you know, engagement online and whatnot. And, and all of a sudden, yeah, it was just a, a fascinating read. So um, I can certainly attest. And I'm going through his current, uh, I'm not sure if it's his current book, but it's one of his more current, This Is Marketing. And, you know, at the moment, once again, a really simple concept of what marketing is. And sometimes we get so caught up in this world of marketing and so many business people, and I, I work with a number of small business people, are so scared of marketing because of that, the numbers game, the ROI. And um, and so understanding this is marketing, and there's a really succinct, um, couple of really succinct uh, snapshots that Seth puts in about what marketing really is that have mm-hmm. really helped some of my clients. So, um, so for yourself, Klaus, what's the vision going forward? So the big vision, the big vision, and this is still the same. It's always been the same. Just it, it becomes sharper and sharper. The more I fail, the more I realize how to kind of yeah. keep it intact. The big vision that keeps me up in the morning that or that gets me up in the mornings is making the world more playful, making the world better at experimenting, less afraid of failure, more open to say what if and yes yeah. and instead of no but. Yeah. More playful, more experimental, more joyful. And that leads to failure. That leads to things going badly. That leads to, 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 that leads to idiot decisions, but it also leads to more, to less stress, to more innovation, and ironically, to more productivity. Then yeah. one of the things I try to teach people is if they want to be productive, well, you can work harder. That'll definitely make you more productive. It's also stressful. <laughs> and at some point, it, it stops kind of having its benefits. Or you can try out more things. And some of those are going to fail, but some of them are going to work and they're going to improve what you do mm-hmm. at a level you couldn't even dream of before. Yeah. And, pro- and being playful is a great way to do that. And I see it over and over again. I see people who do a thing, usually they're entrepreneurs or they're hobbyists or, or they're kind of, they're doing something for fun. And the moment they stop doing it for fun, the moment they start doing it like seriously, yeah, then their productivity suffers. Then it's no longer interesting. Then they don't get it done. Where as long as they're just doing it for the hell of it, then the words flow for their book mm-hmm. or it's fun testing out a new way of having meetings or the new product they're designing. It's a joy to work on and they're making rapid progress. But the moment they stop up and it gets serious, the moment the stakes come in, yeah. And it gets tricky. And this is not, I mean, this is not just me. There are plenty of studies that show that if you ask people to do creative work and you say, here, team A, do it, it's fun. And team B, you get a $10,000 prize if you can do it within an hour. Team A is going to vastly outperform team B. Yeah. Because they're not worrying about the prize. They're just having fun. Yeah, yeah. Really relevant for me at the moment. My son's into horticulture and he does it as as his stress release. And I, and I keep saying, why don't you start a business? Why don't you do it for, for, instead of going to a job that you hate, why don't you look for a job like this? And he, he just says, dad, then it's not my hobby. Then it's not my enjoyment. So I, and I couldn't understand that before. So thank you. You've helped me. So is that, so what are you most proud of that out of everything that you've accomplished? <clears throat> Out of everything, oh, oh, I'm Danish, so it's hard to say anything. I'll, <laughs> I'll forget that. I'll forget that part for a moment. Yeah. What I'm most proud of is I have, since I was 16, helped build communities. Yeah. Usually around imaginary worlds, but also, of course, connect people around imaginary worlds, and you connect them around the real world. But what I'm by far the most proud of is is the communities I've helped build and the kind of the lives I've helped touch. So, yeah. and I know it's a cliche answer, but we joke that at the College of Extraordinary Experiences, our KPIs are how many people chose to get a new job afterwards, 
how many people moved to a different country, how many new friendships, how many new tattoos was an actual yeah. KPI we have. Wow. And so far we have, we have a couple of marriages and our first baby should be, um, well, I can't actually remember if it has arrived or if it's soon. <laughs> And that's not to say that we run a dating empire, but it's to say that what we do is something where people connect yeah. and where people where, where the real joy is the partnerships that come out of it, the new meetings. Yeah. And whenever somebody writes me a mail, and as I get older, it happens more and more. Somebody writes me a mail because I was part of their life 20 years ago. And I said something offhand that I never remember. And then it, it actually made a difference for them. And one of them, and, and this is a true story I got a couple of years back from a now a young man who who was one of the one of the kids at one of our role playing events many years ago. Yeah. And he said, I, "Hey Klaus, we haven't talked for years. Uh, I'm Victor, I used to play here, and I just wanted to tell you a story that made an impact in my life and apparently I was holding a briefing in front of a lot of kids telling them, here's the rules of the day, here's how we're going to here's how we're going to play together." And apparently he was making noise. And I turn around without missing a beat. And I look him in the eye and then I grin and say, burn in hell. And then I go back to the thing. And he said that that was to him the most liberating way to be treated by an adult. Like there's a clear boundary, but it's fun and we move on. Yeah. And it's, it's also a little bit outrageous. And he said that had meant wow. a lot to him in how he thought about the world. And to me, this was just a random thing that happened many years ago that I don't even remember I said yeah. that. And I did feel a little bit guilty and felt, oh, pff, wow, okay, <laughs> I'll take it. But <laughs> is that really what I want to be remembered for? Um, but this, having met people and having touched lives where somebody yeah. writes back many years after and say, hey, this made a difference for me. Yeah. Because we all have those stories. We all have those, sometimes they're teachers, sometimes it's somebody, it's a flight attendant, somebody to somebody yeah. in a supermarket, where what they say at that time matters. And getting to hear from those people, that, that I guess, is what makes me most proud. Yeah. Sometimes it's just those throwaway lines that, people, that, you know, we don't even know we've said them and um, that make the biggest difference. But um, is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you, Klaus? It's been a wide-ranging <laughs> sort a of a question. conversation. <laughs> I used to use that on my own podcast. Um, I think the one thing that... And this is just shameless self-promotion. So yeah. you should ask me, Klaus, if on the off chance that somebody wants to hear more about you or more from what you do, where do they find you? Because the, I know the, that you're you're going to solve problems for them. So. I'll at least try or create, <laughs> which is sometimes just as fun. Um, I think a, a good place to find me is uh, there's only one Klaus Hostel. There's only one with my name for better and worse. So I'm easy to find on things like LinkedIn and I have a solid digital presence. But recently I did a hundred innovation keynotes in a hundred days and that's on my YouTube channel. So on YouTube, if you I'm, search for I'm, my name, I'm tipping my hat for you, for you doing that because I saw it was that insane. And, and I thought that's discipline and that's consistency. So I, I don't think <laughs> it, I used the word insane, but I'm glad you did because <laughs> I, I do. It got to the point where our three-year-old daughter uh, would come in the evening and said, mom needs to go to bed and daddy needs to do a keynote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happened way too often. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's available on your YouTube. Start. Yeah. Yeah. So, so hit me on YouTube, Klaus Innovation on YouTube, and then you'll find a rabbit hole. And if you like one of them, then maybe you want to see more. And if you don't like one, then please don't try to find out more. I was just um, as bad. I was watching the one this afternoon when you're highlighting your office and um, the way that it works. And um, they, uh, after you just moved, so your office wasn't necessarily what we would say pristine and organized. So it was not. Was... It was not. No, I did. Uh, <laughs> I, I did throughout that series. I did a couple of like backstage romps to show people <laughs> the unpolished reality. And I think sometimes it got a bit too unpolished. But yeah, uh, sometimes hopefully that maybe. motivates some people. Klaus, it's been wonderful having you today talking on to us with the Today's Leader. Thank you very much for for your time. Thanks for investing in Today's Leader. And, of course, um, I'm planning to stay in contact. So it's been fascinating. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tony. And keep doing the amazing work you do.
Join the group of people impacted by seriously simple stuff to get you unstuck. The first book by Tony Coach Curl. Available at Amazon, Tony's Simple Stuff provides the tool for people to master your life and aspirations. 20% of every book sold supports Carter's cause. And now, it's time for Tony's Two Cents. So let's talk about innovation, shall we? Now, how relevant was Klaus when he shared his experiences around innovation? Most people love the concept for others, but don't see it as something immensely personal for themselves. It's like change. As humans on this globe, change is something that we mostly adapt to. It's something that happened outside of our sphere of influence, not something that we seek out ourselves, unless, of course, it's been driven by pain. Innovation, change and increasing productivity for leaders all should go hand in hand as they all help to work in developing better leadership structure for you. So what is it that you can bring to the table to innovate, change and be more productive? What does that look like? What does that look like for you? And what does that look like for your team? How can you challenge yourself to be an innovator of you? So how can you challenge yourself to be an innovator of you? Because I know that once you start working internally and once you start innovating you, you will drive better results. So where in your life can you create a KPI like the one that Klaus has for some of his programs, like how many tattoos were created as a result? So where in your life can you create a KPI like that? And of course, that's my two cents. Thanks, Klaus, for investing in today's leaders. And as always, his links are in the show notes. Now is the time for you to take control of your leadership growth in this disruptive world we navigate. Our aim is to help you become the leader you need to be today. If you're looking to build better leadership skills, check out the Today's Leader website at todaysleader.com.au. Our website showcases our podcast and our magazine, and we're pleased to say our masterminds are now available. Today's Leader is a collective mindset for the leaders and entrepreneurs of today, forging the path of success for tomorrow. We have the mindset to make a difference and the ability to create an impact. Think and Grow Business hosts our Today's Leader masterminds, Think and Grow Business, where we focus on personal, professional, and business growth. Book your free 30-minute discovery call at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. Don't forget you are standing stronger, braver, and wiser. Don't ever forget the golden rule. You know what that is. Just don't be an arsehole. I'll see you next time.